So instead of doubt, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna trust. Then I'm gonna understand. I'm gonna understand. I'm gonna and I'm gonna trust. I'm gonna trust. And then I'm gonna negotiate. What's the end? Well, no, I gotta first I gotta trust. Then I gotta you unite with the love. Oh, I thought it was understand. No, unite with the love. You How gotta do, you do that. Because love casts out fear. How do you unite with it? The minute you focus on love, you're uniting with it. What it is, Brad Lee back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs today in the studio, folks. As always, I got a real treat for you. John Gordon in the house. Hey, Brad. Now, folks, if you guys don't know who this dude is, best-selling author of all time, speaker, consultant. I mean, the list goes on and on, but you probably know him from one of his many books, 28 books, 15 of them bestsellers. What happened to the other 13? <laughs> five were children's books, so oh, they're five. not going to make the list. They don't make lists? Not for children's How come? books. I don't know. They don't have them for, for bestsellers. That's foolish. Books. So five, and the rest just didn't make the list. You know what's funny? Why all the foolishness when it comes to stuff like that? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't get that. We should have a bestseller list for kids' books. I think that would be actually pretty cool. Do you ever turn your phone on, do not disturb? Um, no, I just put it in silent. I do that and then it buzzes and it still distracts me. I keep, I don't have vibrations at all. Well, I need to, I need to, uh, pick your brain on a few things. Number one, your main, I would say expertise would be what leadership, leadership, culture, mindset, no doubt about it. And, and, and teamwork as well. I work with a lot of organizations on building great teams, but it really does come down to mindset. Like if you don't have a positive mindset, if you don't have a great mindset, you can't be a great leader. You can't be a high performer. You can't be great in sales. So you got to have the right mindset. Did I just drop a bomb? I can't hear my own sound effects. Let me see. There we go. <laughs> That's a bomb. That's, that means the people listening need to pay attention because I tell people this, tell me if I'm right. If you want to succeed, period, you need the right mindset. Would you agree with that? Of course. The right skill set. Definitely. Or skill sets and the right habits. You That's it. it. Right there. That's all you need. Those three things. And a work ethic, obviously, which goes into that. Well, those would be the right habits. Right. Okay. Ha habit is something that you do habitually. So if you got the right habits, that's your work ethic right there. And I would also say, you and I'm, by the way, I'm trying to simplify everything just yeah. so, just so you know me, I'm like the guy that'll take something complicated and make it really simple. Or I try to. Yeah. And then sometimes when I'm in a room full of people, I make them feel stupid. Like, have you ever read How to Win Friends and Influence People? Oh, yeah. I do the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I'm serious. Like, I'll make something seem so easy to understand. And people are like, oh, man, you made me feel stupid. And it's not good because then people leave resenting you. So how do you get in a leadership position where, you know, what if you think you're the smartest guy in the room? I think the key to leadership is, is providing clarity. So if you are making it simple, you're actually making people better. So that's actually a good thing. People appreciate my books because I take complex ideas and make them simple. And I've been attacked at times for being too simple. Like, oh, that book's just too simple. Oh, the energy bus is like, read Go Dog Go instead. And it has pictures because it's such a simple book. But it's the simple that people could act on. So you said habits are essential. If you want great habits, you gotta make it simple for people, provide clarity so they can actually take action and then they'll see results from their actions that they're taking. But for leadership, I think you should make it simple. You have to give people clarity so they know what to do. And the best leaders that I've worked with, they really provide clarity of vision, clarity of mission, clarity of, of the kind of culture we're creating, habits of and behaviors of how we're gonna get there and ultimately, why do we exist? Why are we here? What are we here to do? That's deep, deep stuff. Folks, listen, pay attention. He's got a new book out, The One Truth, right? Is it out right now? It's out right now. It came out last week. So as this episode drops, it's already out there. What I want you to do, if you like what this gentleman has to say and you like our discussion today, is not only share it with everybody that you know, you're going to want to like and share this. I want you to go out and buy the book, The One Truth. And I want to see how many books we can cause right. to spike. Because, dude, the bomb squad's getting pretty big, and we're getting pretty powerful. I have people that come on that say, ultimately, you know, they've been on a big slew of podcasts, and they're like, dude, your podcast. I'm like, what? They're like, dude, your podcast lit up my phone. That Like, it made a change. There's a difference with your podcast. I'm like, really? He goes, dude, I go on a lot of them, and a lot of them are the big ones. And the big ones, they drop their episode, and nothing really happens at all. 
They say, yours, you drop yours, dude. Freaking, I can tell that you dropped it. Yeah. I'm like, good, man. That's the bomb squad. Cheers to the bomb squad. But anyway, go out and get the book. Let's make him say the same thing for me, folks. John Gordon. So you can find him also at johngordon.com. You can follow him on social media at John Gordon 11. Why 11? Was that your number? Because J O N Gordon was already taken. So I had to add the 11 to it. And 11 was my lucky number. Like energy bus, there's, there's, you know, number 11 of the bus. Training camp is 11 characteristics of what the best do better. So I've woven 11 into a lot of things. It's, it's a Why special 11? number. I see 11 11 a lot. So do I. That's and, an angel number. Yeah, it is. And and 111. So we see it a lot. It's it's basically a sign saying, I got you. I wonder what that really means, 11 11. Because, dude, I'm telling you, we'll be sitting here chit chatting. It's 11 11. I'll look at my clock for no reason. And it's 11 11. And I think to myself, why do I, why do I always notice that? Because yeah. everything is energy and everything is ultimately numbers. We live in a numerical kind of energetic universe. And so 1111, they call it the gateway. Like there's a connection between the ethereal or the essence of the eternal and the temporary. And I think 1111 is like that intersection between the temporary and the eternal. Very deep, but that's what I believe. Yeah, well, it may be. I, I think I'm connected. Very well, much so. I, I've, I've chose five roulette numbers in a row and got kicked off the table. Wow. My wife was there as a witness. There was others there as a witness too, but how do you call five in a row? You're connected. It's unbelievable. Dude, it's like psychic. It's yeah. like intuitive. It's like there's a, I believe there's a connectivity with all of us. The question is, is how many of us realize it and can, and can fine tune it some better than others. I'm not, I can't do it every time. Like mm -hmm. I go into a casino sometimes and be like, okay, let me do this again. Bang. And I lose. I'm like, shit, <laughs> that didn't work. Damn it. But on occasion, dude, I will guess a roulette number on occasion, regularly. Mm. Isn't that crazy? That goes to the one truth. That is the essence of oneness. The one truth is that everything comes down to oneness or separateness. And so when you're feeling separate, you feel disconnected, you feel divided, you feel weak and powerless. When you feel one, you feel connected, you feel powerful, you have more confidence, courage, there's more clarity. Namaste says the spirit in me recognizes the spirit in you. Ultimately, we are all one. The scripture that says nothing could separate you from the love of God. You're always connected to that love. So the ultimate reality is that the essence of who we are is, is oneness. And so you are tuning into, no doubt, somehow, some way, you're tuning into that oneness and that connection, which is just so, so powerful. I love hearing that. So, dude, how did you hear about all this? Like, what, like, like, He's the author of 28 books, including 15 bestsellers and five children's books, which is The Energy Bus is one, sold over 3 million. The Carpenter, which was a top five business book of the year. Training Camp, The Power of Positive Leadership, The Power of Positive Team. The Coffee Bean. Why the Coffee Bean? Coffee Bean is this incredible, cool message. I was at Clemson University speaking to the team. And afterwards, Dabo Sweeney, the head coach, came up to me. I speak there every year for the last 12 years. Hey, we just had this guy, Damon West. And Damon West came and spoke. And he talked about the carrot, the egg, and the coffee bean. So Dabo starts telling me about this message. The minute I heard the message, I saw the book. Like, I saw the visual. I think of the world in terms of books. Like, I get ideas, and I go, that's a book. And I knew right away this would be a book that would impact a lot of people's lives. Because it's ultimately about inside out. Clemson became an inside out program, which made them so successful. They don't worry about the fans. They don't worry about where they're playing. They don't worry about what uniforms they're wearing. It's about inside out. It's about us, who we are, our spirit, our passion, our joy, our work ethic. So inside out was the message I taught them. Well, he tells me about the carrot they get in the coffee bean. You put a carrot into boiling hot water, what happens to the carrot? It's softened, gets weakened by the environment. You put an egg into boiling hot water, what happens to the egg? It gets hardened by the environment. When the world feels like it's a big pot of boiling hot water, you can be like the egg, a hardened heart, bitter, angry, you know, frustrated. You can be like that carrot. You get weakened, fearful, anxious, and stressed like so many are going through life right now. Or you could be the coffee bean. You take that coffee bean and you put that into boiling hot water, it actually makes coffee. It transforms the water into coffee. It transforms the environment. It's not defined by the environment. It transforms its circumstance. What does that represent? The power that everyone has within us, just like you. I mean, this podcast, the impact you're having, you're an inside out person. You're creating from the inside out. 
and you're a powerful force in this world, but so many go through life blaming their circumstance. They blame the events. They blame the traffic for making them feel a certain way. But one day you're in traffic and it bothers you. The next day you're in the same traffic and it doesn't. Is it the traffic? No, it's always your state of mind. Well, I would have to agree because that's the mindset. State of mind, mindset, it's yep. perspective. It's yep. all kind of related. Yep. Wouldn't you agree? Totally. And here's the thing. This is what the one truth's about in a big way. When you have a low state of mind, low state, circumstance happens and it bothers you, that event, that circumstance. H high state of mind, same circumstance can happen and it doesn't. You rise above, you move forward, you move on, you keep going, right? So it wasn't the circumstance, it was our state of mind. Low state of mind, the circumstance happens, it has power over you. When you're in a high state of mind, you have power over your circumstance. You're probably gonna ask, what does it mean low state or high state, right? Well, no, um, I'm thinking, is that a f the same thing as a frequency? Yes, very much so. So what I say in the book, what is revolutionary, what no one has said before, is that the brain is actually an antenna. Not like an antenna, it is an antenna. And you're either tuning into. If two of them are put together, would that make antennae? <laughs> I don't know. Or would there be I antennas? About that. I, would, I don't know. I actually didn't think about that. Even though I'm a writer, English was not always my best subject, believe it or not. My, my, my English teacher said, uh, don't go to that college. You won't be able to get in. Even if you get in, it'll be too hard for you. This is my English teacher. I'm a writer now. So don't always listen to your high school teachers. Where did you go to college? I went to Cornell University. Cornell University. See, you even got that down. So folks, I was saying, you know, the reason you would listen to him, but I wanted to set that up to say, where did you learn all of this? How did, where, where did you begin? You were a young lad at one point. Now all of a sudden you're an expert in leadership yeah. and mindset and how, how'd you get there? So what happened was a number of years ago, I was miserable and negative and I lost my job, what, dur what job? during the dot-com crash. What job? Business though? development for a technology So you were company. a salesman. I was in sales. I actually sold the NFL on NFL wireless. We were the first service to actually take scores and put them on mobile devices for mainframe computers. So we did that for the NFL, but it was a pilot program. Okay, and you we were did, in business development, which is code for sales, folks. Code for sales, exactly. And before that though, I opened up a bar in Atlanta, in Buckhead. So you were an entrepreneur. Right, a place called Park Bench. When I was 24 years old, I opened up my first bar. Dude, how at 24? Like, did you come from a rich family? No, I did not. Blue collar family. Dad was a New York City police officer. New York so City how did you have the money? narcotics. How'd you have the money? So I'm so glad you're asking. This is good. Uh, $30,000. My grandmother left me when she died. My grandmother. Bless her heart. Yep. That's all I had. That money I took and put it into mutual funds. My brother took his and went to New York City and spent it all. I'm 18 years old and I put this money into mutual funds. Now, who guided you to do that? See, most 18 year olds would not do that. They would go to New York City and spend it. I was interested in, in, uh, in money at that point. I was reading some Wall Street journal books even at that point. I remember reading about investing and uh, I'm trying to remember Peter. Cottontail. <laughs> no, it was if he was the fidelity guy and he was talking about investing and how to invest in stocks. Not, not feel or teal. No, it wasn't teal. He wasn't even around back then. But, but I put that money into the mutual fund after just learning about mutual funds. But see, dude, that's not easy for an 18 year old. Yeah. See that, that right there made you different. By the way, that goes right back to, you know, having the right mindset right you your mindset must have been good even at 18 who gave you that mindset i think so uh, in many ways you know what my mindset was at 18 what let me get some pussy <laughs> all i wanted was girls right well i was definitely chasing girls at that age too but, was, but but at the end of the day i mean like you know how if someone would have gave me thirty thousand dollars back then right. shit dude matter of fact <laughs> Every dime I got, I'd spend right. chasing females or impressing females yeah. or trying to, you know, I, I did. I wasn't smart enough to invest in yeah. mutual funds. Like yeah. who would have thought? Right. I and do, how old are you? I am now 52. Yeah. So you were about the, almost the same age. I'm a little older than you, but really you look great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, so at the end of the day though, we're talking about the same age. So when you were, you was 18, I was about 18. <laughs> I was 20. And I was still a jack off. So how did you know to, hey, let me, let me invest this money. Like, how come your brother didn't? Right. 
I think that goes to our awareness. It goes to our state of mind. It goes to our consciousness. I know, but your brothers, why wouldn't you guys both be raised the same way? We were raised the same way, but everyone is different. Everyone is unique. And your state of mind determines ultimately your future and your reality. You have a different state of mind than you had when you're 18. So your well, state luck, of mind will create your reality. Yeah, luckily it caught up. <laughs> and I'm doing okay now. <laughs> doing a lot better now. So at 18, I had this awareness. I mean, I'm someone who was able to get into Cornell University and Ivy League school played lacrosse there. So I always had an awareness in terms of being a leader, doing the right thing. I was told by friends years later, actually parents, friends who were involved in the process of me going to Cornell that they were doing backgrounds on me. And they said, he's a, he's a fine young man who has a good awareness and so forth. So I guess I had some kind of awareness. I don't know where it came from, but I think that was just who I was, right? It's the essence of who we are. Do you think you would have got in today? No. Why? Well, one, I think it's just so hard to get in today. And lacrosse definitely. It's not that hard to get in. Lacrosse got me in. You got to be in their clubs. Yes, lacrosse got me in because I wasn't in the clubs. I wasn't involved in. You See, know. that's another thing, dude. When I was 18, I never even heard of lacrosse. How yeah. in the hell? Where would you grow up? I grew up in Long Island, New York. And there was lacrosse? It was, it was big then. In high school? Long Island and Maryland were the breeding grounds initially of lacrosse. It's where. In it, high school? In high school. It was the hotbed back then. Now it's growing everywhere. You didn't play football. I didn't I play played football. What'd you play? I played running back. And I was, no, I was recruited, I was recruited to play in college. Football? Yeah. Dang. Not, not big time, but like Yale, Lehigh. Like uh, you went to Yale, like I went to jail. <laughs> I, went Close. To Yale, I went to Yale on a visit and I'm like, there's no way I'm going here. I don't care if I get in. Why? I'm not going. I just didn't feel like I belonged. It just, I'm a blue collar kid from Long Island, New York. I just didn't feel like I belonged Yeah, But I went to Cornell and my buddies that I stayed with on a recruiting trip, like they were my buddies then, but these guys were blue collar kids from Long Island as well that coach loved blue collar kids because they were hard workers. So he would recruit these kids who did well in school, good grades, and were blue collar kids. Brought them to Cornell and then had a huge impact on their life. So I go there on my recruiting trip and I'm like, I'm coming here. I, I talk like this, you know, I had an accent from Long Island. You know, I was like, this place is great. I'm going here. I had the gold chain, the tank top, the Camaro. You know, I was I was a kid straight out of the year Camaro. I don't even remember. Dude, I have the Camaro. You had the Camaro? Yes, yeah, 77. Nice. Best best car you ever saw in your life. I had a 79 Mustang also. So, so <laughs> I don't I still don't know how you developed it, but let's just say you just got lucky. Yeah. Cuz your brother didn't develop it. Right. Did he eventually develop it? Yeah, I think my brother is much better with his money now. He's okay. still It's funny though. I is he rich? He's doing well. He's doing is well. Is he rich? I went in class. I think, I'd say I'd say rich. When someone says, what is rich? Yeah, someone asked to, me the other day, what's rich? Well, to me, a, a million dollars or more. A year? Yeah. He's almost there, I would say. You got to make a million dollars a year or you're not necessarily rich. Now, can you be well off? Sure you can. How much? In my opinion, five, six hundred thousand, you're pretty comfortable. Yeah. I, nowadays, it's getting worse and worse, but- Dude, five or six hundred grand, you're living pretty good. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think you make, you can make a good life with with that amount for sure. Think Three time. to five hundred, you're 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 getting out of the rat race. You've now got the the minimum requirements to escape. All right. Three to five hundred. Three to five hundred. Wow, it's not a lot. I mean, it's not it's not a lot, but dude, that's a lot. But it's to a, a lot, lot for a lot of people. That's what I'm saying. When you say rich. By most standards, to the average American, three to five hundred is rich. No, that ain't rich. But to the average American who's making thirty thousand a year, it is. Mindset, perspective. Mindset, perspective. See, and by the way, why don't those people realize that that's not rich? Why do they think it is, and other people like me thinks it's not? What's the difference? Yeah, I think it's about our perspective, where we come from, what we see, what we think is possible. So often, when you're in that kind of life, you you don't think it's possible. I mean, for me, I was bartending waiting tables in Atlanta right after college. I moved down there. I didn't get into the law schools I wanted to get into. So I moved to Atlanta to create my life. I'm gonna go there and create my life. So I'm waiting tables. And as I'm doing it, I'm thinking, there's gotta be a better way to make money than waiting tables. So for me, it was bartending. I'm gonna become a bartender. And then I started bartending. Because well, you like more tips? Bigger tips. You don't have to work as hard. I just knew bartending and bartenders made more money and it was a lot more fun and easier than you go to serve someone when you're a waiter. And bartenders got laid. When you're, when you're a bartender, they come see you. And so I wasn't really after that. I was actually more interested in the money in, in but, bartending. But, but, but again, me back then, yeah. I would have said bartending over waiting. But um, yeah. 
It would have been to meet all the girls at the bar. And a lot of girls would come see me. Sure, A lot of guys would. would come see me, friends. And so I'm now making this bar a lot of money because people are coming to see me. And I thought, got to be a better way. I said, I should open up my own place. I'm standing on the corner one day and Richard Beasley is basically on the corner walking. And I said, hey, Richard, would you ever sell your place? It was right next door. He goes, everything's for sale. And so literally got a few people together. My manager of the bar I was working at, he came in and, and we all went in together. I put that 30 in, everyone put in 30. We financed the rest and we opened up this park bench place. That's how it got started. How, how, how did it go? Went great. Right away, I'm making about 100,000 a year at 24 years old, 25 years old, back in 1995, 1996. And this place is booming, live music. I was marketing, I was great at marketing. So I would get people to come to the bar, I'd get them to come hang out and people would just come. That's how I met my wife. So three weeks after opening the bar, she's walking down the street and I see her. And I'm like, come on in. And I look at her, I'm like, wow. It was love at first sight. For her, it took a few years, but for me, it was love at first sight. And she did not come in, but she goes, I'll, I'll come back. I go, come back Friday. She goes, okay. She never came back. But a week later, I saw her at the Best of Atlanta charity event, and there she was, and I ran up to her. So I, I never lived the single life of a bar owner, which is actually a good thing. That's but, a good thing. But yeah, great thing. But that's how I met You could have ended up with one of those fellers that got AIDS and died. <laughs> it would not have been a good thing. Isn't that crazy when you really think about it? How lucky are we? You could have lost an eye. Yeah. You didn't. Hmm. There's so many events in your life when you look back of what could have happened to you and the things that could have gone wrong, the accident you avoided at the last minute by saying something said, look, or turn in that last moment. And I always wonder that, like for others, they do have the accident, but for you, you were able to get through it unscathed. What is that? Like my daughter crashed her car and really should have been very hurt when you look at the car and you look at how it was totaled and she got out and walked fine. Same thing happened to me. I remember driving home from my girlfriends in college and literally coming home and around the corner, there was a car parked. I didn't see it. Bam. I nailed this car going 30, 40 miles an hour, whole right side taken off. And yet I walked out. It was fine. I call that blessed. Big time blessed. I really believe that in so many ways and so many times in my life that, that God carried me through those moments. No doubt about it. Do you have any body pains? No, me either. Like you see a lot of people around 50, 60 years old, they're starting, oh, my shoulder got to get surgery and all oh, my back. And like, I'm starting to deteriorate. And I'm like, is that from years of beating your body up? You know, or because again, these guys have been in fitness their whole life. And now they're a little bit damaged. I think it's inflammation. In a lot of ways, it's inflammation. And it's the diets that we're eating that's causing the inflammation. And so when you have more inflammation, you're going to have a lot of aches and pains in your body. Uh, are you a vegan? No. What diets do you follow? I mostly eat seafood, wild seafood. I eat grass-fed beef, organic rice, organic vegetables, organic blueberries. I love organic dates in the morning. What, how do you know they're Avocado. organic? Avocado. How do you know they're organic? Well, you buy them and you hope they are. That's obviously my wife and I talk about this. Like we're buying this. How do we know it really is safe? How do we know what they're you don't. spraying it? We really don't. And that's why we're all dying. <laughs> I choose to see the positive, Brad, but I agree with you. There is a big concern in the chronic illness that we have that we did not have years ago. So many people have chronic illness today. And so many people who deal with all these different illnesses. You're not meant to go through life having chronic illness. Like you're not meant to. We are forgotten what it's like to actually be whole and healthy. Yeah, I think I am though. I mean, even though I'm not like six pack abs, I feel great. Me too. Always do. I think it's because again, the choices you make every day, but you work out. I work out. I walk a lot. I lift. I feel great. I started lifting after becoming friends with Ed Milet. We became good friends. And how long ago? Like during the pandemic. Well, that's not, that's not been very long. No. So I started lifting after that. Were you fatty before? Not fatty, but I work at the Miami Heat and I've spoken to the team a number of times. And Eric Spolcher said, John, you used to look like a writer. Now you look like the athlete that you actually were. And so, so you were a little pudgy. A little pudgy, got out of shape, you know, wasn't exercising a lot, wasn't lifting. And so now at 52, I am in the best shape of my life. I am stronger better now i'd be guys in pickleball who are in their 30s even 20s at 52 people 
play pickleball. Oh yeah, in their twenties. Oh yeah, 20s I thought and 30s. pickleball is kind of like bridge. It's no, for old, no, it's for a old lot of, folks. A lot of young guys. I play with a lot of former Division One athletes, and we play pickleball. I played with David Pollock the other day from ESPN Game Day. We is, battled. Is pickleball like tennis without the bounce? It's like tennis combined with ping pong. Without the bounce. Without the bounce. It's like but a the ball full bounces. size ping pong. The ball bounces, but it's a plastic ball, and it's. It's, I always see them going smack, smack, yeah. smack. They don't bounce it. No, but if that's it in the bounces, air. is it legal? Yeah, it does bounce. And if it bounces once, and you'll get a high enough bounce where you hit it like a tennis stroke. Yeah. Let me say that, but a little shorter stroke. How long have you been playing pickleball? I, I, two years. Why now. do they call it pickleball? I don't know. I don't know. I, I was wondering the same name. Because <laughs> you guys look like you're playing with your pickle. <laughs> Why don't you play real tennis? <laughs> I do play tennis. Do you? I love tennis. Yeah. I, I, I tried. I sucked. Yeah. I, I started playing in my early 40s because my son was a competitive tennis player. Oh, no kidding. So I started playing so I could play with him. And as we started playing, um, I got better and better. He would crush me, though. But but again, being a former athlete, I uh, was able to pick it up pretty quick and, and just love hitting. I didn't play a lot of tournaments, but I just love hitting with the pros. So Ed got you to work w- out? Lifting. Yeah. I create him all the time because, again, if it did wasn't he, Did him, he say, brother? You no, he goes, wait, brother. Uh, no. I saw Ed when we got together, and this guy was my age and in great shape and just looked jacked. And I'm like, you know what? I need to get like that. Like, if he could do it, I could do it. Like, I used to be fit. I used to work out a lot like this. Like, get back to it. So he just inspired me. He encouraged me. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's always been in shape since I've met him, yeah. since I've known him. That's, I think, one of his you know, key attributes. But the other one would be, I think he's made, you know, close to a billion dollars or some shit. He's made a lot of money. Yeah. yeah and, he, been, and, he, he, and he's a great human being, as you know. Great guy. He's been very successful. The funny thing, the funniest thing I, I see about Ed is every one of his interviews are the best. <laughs> like, he's good. Hey, he, he said my interview with him was the best, just so he, you know. He said it. I'm listen, taking it. He's good, I'm at taking com- it. he's good at compliments. Yes. I don't care what he says about anyone else. He said mine was the best, so I'm taking that. When Ed's talking to you, he, he makes you feel like you're special. Yeah. And, and on those podcasts that he does, um, you know, I think he, it's just his mannerisms are all so polite and everything. That's why sometimes I think, well, man, maybe I should start doing that. I'm talking about stupid shit like you're playing with your pickle and stupid <laughs> shit. You know, Ed would never say something like that. <laughs> but you got to be you. And I hey, think that's be, right. being you and being authentic to who you are is actually what makes you compelling. It's what makes you have an audience that actually wants to support you and your guests because they trust you because you're real. My uncle was a sanitation engineer, which means he was a garbage man. My dad was a New York City police officer, but they were the two greatest guys, you know, on the planet. And they were just so real and they talk like you, this and you, they told stories. Do you think, you think dad had any, any shady shit going on? My dad was a badass. And it was back in the day, New yeah. York cops, dude. Yeah. They, and not to make them bad. Yeah. But they didn't always follow the law. No, because why? Because they were they were tr- trying to serve justice. Yeah, not just follow the law. He did the right thing in a lot of ways because we would have had a lot more money if he was doing other things that I did not see and I know did not come our way. But I know that battling the drug cartels of the streets of New York, like he was doing, he definitely had to face a lot of things. And there are stories I can't tell, honestly, that were you know rough, rough stories in terms of like I literally had FBI watching me go to school Damn. because of stuff that he was dealing with in New York. So, and he won the combat cross and we went and met the governor and the mayor one time for an award he got. So he was pretty straight up. Now, did he sometimes, you know, get violent with criminals that he chased for a mile or something like that? Would he, would he do things that couldn't be done today? I'm sure there were things there that just pissed him off, you know, yeah. as he got older, when he retired in his you know early seventies, like I don't carry a gun cause someone's going to, piss me off and I'm going to shoot him. So I can't do that. See, I always wanted to be a cop just cause I think that sounds like the most badass career you could have, have fun as hell. Yeah. But I also was maybe thankful that it never happened because back then my integrity and my ethics weren't fully developed. Let's yeah. just say, and I might've busted in a house, saw, you know, a hundred pounds of cocaine and $30 million. And of course arrested the individual and brought him down and turned in the eight ball and, you know, 10 grand yeah. that I found. Yeah. The rest would be in my trunk. Yeah. And then I'd be in prison as an ex cop. And everyone knows you don't want to go to prison if you were a police officer. Right. Oh, definitely not. That'd and be scary. You know what's worse? What? A child predator. Mm, definitely. Mess with a kid and go to prison. 
dude, your ass is as good as beat to a pulp. I've heard really bad stories about that. That's why anytime a freaking child molester goes to prison, I freaking applaud. Yeah. Why? Because, dude, they're going to get their asses beat, which is worse, if you ask me, than death. Would you rather get beat up for the next three years of your life every day? Beat up or just die? Yeah, that's rough. What would you rather do? I would rather get beat up, to be honest. I'd Not me. Fight, but, Did but, I say three but, years? <laughs> I meant 30 years. Oh, uh, but yo, yeah. Okay. Like, in other words, you're going to get yeah. beat up the rest of your fucking life. I might as well just say pass. Well, I would. I don't think that would happen because the one thing I despise most is child predators. And I think about the kids that suffer abuse. And it's funny because I, not funny, but it's like much of my work now is as I talk to people who are struggling who will reach out to me after events or hear about the oneness and separateness. Like, we know that narcissism actually is something where people feel separate. And most narcissists actually have suffered some sort of wound, some kind of trauma when they're younger. And that causes them to feel separate. They actually have certain parts of the brain shut off other parts to protect itself. So there's a separation at the neurological level of the brain. And so talking to people like that who have struggled and the fear they have and the betrayal that they've experienced, they have trouble trusting and even trusting God. So when you meet people like that, it just reminds me more and more of, of the pain that people go through at the hands of evil like that. I think that is the ultimate evil. And I even wrote about this in the book. Like it's the ultimate evil where you're taking away someone's trust that they're meant to have that brings them to oneness and they have trouble trusting. So they go through life feeling separate. And yeah, I, that that's something I despise that and the evil that happens from that. So if someone's listening that that they're like, dude, you just named me. Like that's me you just described. How would they fix that? So it's not like you can fix it, but it's actually knowing that there's nothing wrong with you and you're not broken, right? You experienced some sort of trauma and experience can that I, can made we, you feel a certain way. Well, let me stop you there. Cause, cause like, say that again, you do what you realize that you're not broken. You're not broken. Okay. So now if, when you say that to me, I'd be like, duh. Like who do people think they're yes. broken? Yeah, they feel they've broken. They feel like that they need to be fixed. Like I need to be fixed because there's something of be because wrong something with happened me. to yep. them. There's something wrong with me. That's weird. Yeah, and nothing is wrong with you. You had an experience that happened to you, and it wasn't your fault. Hey, so hold, hold on. Is, Ed Milet says it happens for you. Well, what do you think of that? Let's just go first. It happened to you. Didn't happen for you. No. Oh, Ed, you listening, dog? I'm tell I'm telling Ed as soon as we're off this that you disagree with him. It happened because he's one of those guys that says it happens for you, brother. Right. There are challenges. I'm I'm on your yeah. side, by the way. Let me go with. Let I me, think it happens to you. It happens to you, but how you turn that around? It could be for you. Like your greatest pain could also become your greatest assignment. Yeah, well, your greatest challenge because because so often the people that that does happen to. They wind up accomplishing incredible know, somebody, things if, in their life. If, they wind if, up being healers. They wind up helping people. Yeah, but John, if somebody kidnapped your child right. and you know went out and murdered them and it was a big story in your town and you became like that one guy, what's his name? Uh, John. Remember he 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 had his child abducted yeah. and who turned into the the TV guy? Yeah. Um, I forget his name now. But anyway, like that happened to him. That yeah. didn't happen for him. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think those things happen for you. Yeah, but I, but I like think that. how you turn it around, though, and how yeah. you use that in your life for good is a choice we all have. Hey, by the way, uh, you look a little like Tim Allen. Really? Anybody tell you that? No. No? no. Who, who do people say you look like? Jim Carrey and, an old, and a young Wayne Newton. Uh, I see a little Wayne. I don't see any Jim, I don't see any Jim Carrey, that. thank God. You don't want to look like Jim no. Carrey. No, when he was younger, I guess. Yeah, Jim Carrey, you know, when he... When you Tim think Allen, of Jim Carrey, what do you think of? You don't think of a, a guy looking all Vogue and shit. And you think of fucking me, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> hey, so so right before uh, we we change subjects there, number one, I want people to understand, you also work with a lot of pro athletes. Mm. You're, you're helping people that are like the best in the world at their sport, and sometimes they've got a little confidence issue, a little depression. How is that possible? Well, because we all have... A hole in our soul. We all have these ebbs and flows of thought of, of high states of mind, low states of mind. Low state is a lot of anxiety, fear, worry, doubt. High state, there's a lot of clarity, confidence, courage, power, purpose. Like, you know where you're going and why you're going there. So we're going to have these 
ups and downs in these states that will actually determine how we respond in those moments. When, when you're in a low state of mind, you don't want the ball in those moments. And there are times, right, we have doubt. There but how, times, how, how do you stay in the top one? How do you, you don't stay there. You know there's an ebb and flow, but the way you stay there is the same way you asked me earlier, how do we fix this when we have a challenge of some kind of wound or trauma or pain that causes us to feel separate? And the way you do that is you return back to oneness, to wholeness. How do you do that? You know that you have a hole in your soul. Everyone has a hole in their soul, H-O-L-E. And the key to life is, is to become more whole, W-H-O-L-E. We'll have a wound that we've experienced in the course of our life that needs to be healed. Guess what? Inflammation of the soul, that's what we have. That's guilt, that's shame, that's focusing on the past, the things that happened to us. And when things happen to us, we actually now feel like it's our fault and we have shame and guilt as a result of that. So what heals that? Love and forgiveness. And love is the highest frequency in the universe. It's the most powerful frequency. So when you're loving something and loving competing and loving the moment and loving the battle, you're now at a higher state of mind. So how do we stay there? We focus on love instead of fear. Fear divides, love unites. The root for the Greek word of anxious means to separate and divide. So when you're anxious, you feel separate and divided. What's the opposite of that? Feeling connected and one. A team that is connected and united is a powerful team. A team that is actually divided and separate is a very weak team. Wouldn't that cease to be a team? Well, you're theoretically, you're still labeled as a team, but you're not really a team in those moments. Right. A real team, talk about real, a real team fights for each other, not, not a seal each other. team, even though they do too. They do too. A Big real time. team. A real team. And they fight for each other, not against each other. They're here to serve each other. They're selfless, not selfish, right? Small ego, big mission with a team. We get this big mission. That's more important than the egos we have individually. But going back to the high performer, Michael Jordan, I talked to guys who play with Michael. I talked to some of his coaches. What made him so great? People say, oh, he hated to lose. He feared losing. No, hate will never make you great. It's part of the equation. Hating to lose is good. You're stubborn. You want to win. But he loved the battle. He loved to compete. So he's playing against you. He's competing and he's battling and actually he wants to destroy you. So he's loving that battle. He's not thinking about failing, about missing a shot. He's not worried about any of that. He's so focused on the moment. And you think about a lot of people today. They're worried about the outcome, worried about the numbers, worried about their social media, worried about what people think. When you're loving what you do, that's why you're so much more powerful, folks. And I would venture to say, <laughs> just knowing you, you're in a high state of mind a lot of the times because you have a lot of clarity and you know what you want to do and you know who you are. And there's an essence of that. But healing does need to take place for, for a lot of people on their journey. For the how life. do we know if we need to be healed? We all do. Someone asked me that the other day, a high-profile high athlete. How do I know? How do we know? We all yeah, but what if you don't? What if you're just enlightened? We all need to be healed. Unless you're Jesus, we all need to be healed. Well, I'm not Jesus. <laughs> and, and neither am I. And by the way, that wasn't even his name. You know his name? Yeah. What was it? It was Joshua. That's right. Yeah. My man. Yeah. I knew you'd know. So, so there's people out there listening, though. They need to be healed. They realize they need to be healed. They're depressed. They don't feel good. You know, what do you know about depression and how to help someone listening to this? Matter of fact, one time I was talking to a guy. He came in on the podcast and he said, dude, your podcast saved my life mm, supposedly i'm like well how's that um he was on the couch because his mom had died mm. and his dad right not too long earlier and so he was sitting on the couch basically contemplating you know sadness and despair and suicide and all this crazy shit and it's like because of a, con a conversation i was having with somebody about that like mm. you know dude you got man boobs like, get off the couch, get back into life. What do you think your parents would have wanted? Yada, yada, yada. Someone called and said, dude, that literally got them off the couch. So That's you never awesome. know who you're helping. You never do. And guess what? Everyone needs someone to care about them or to say something that will encourage them. The word encourage means to put courage into. And so when you're encouraging someone, you're putting courage into him. You probably gave him courage through your encouragement, which is, which is. Well, see, again, you, I'm the opposite of how to win friends and influence people. I'm, I'm discouraging probably. I don't think that's discouraging. I think that's challenging. And the best coaches I've ever worked with, and I've worked with the best, love and accountability. Like sometimes because I grew up in the car business, maybe I, I feel like if you have a camaraderie with a group of dudes, you know, 
putting them down and capping on them and fucking with them is the, is the best form of love you can show without looking gay. <laughs> if they know you, I don't even know how to answer that. Like dude, like dudes that hug each other all the time. Like there's nothing wrong with hugging. I know it, but like my parents never hugged me really. You know, my brothers and sisters, like when we see each other after a while, we don't hug. We might not even shake hands, but like, hey, what's up? What's up? And when we leave, all right, peace, see you later. We don't, we're not like, love you. Like, dude, that's your brother. Why would you tell your brother you love him? But in reality, how stupid does that sound? Right. But it's the truth. There's a lot of people out there that are like that. They don't like that love shit. What do you think happened to them? I don't know what happened to them. I can't speak to them. I do know that they do need love and every human being wants love. And every human being feels empty and despair without it. And when you feel disconnected and you feel separate and you feel divided and you feel anxious and you're worried all the time and you're going through life feeling powerless, then you know something's wrong. You know you need something more. So how did, will this book help me? How oh, do I fix that? That book is the answer to that. This book is the answer to, 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 to depression. It's the answer to the anxiety. It's the key to mental health. It's the key it, to mental health. about toughness. confidence? It's the key to confidence. Because I'm putting together this something. This is all right. about confidence. Well, I'm putting together something right now about confidence too. Because, dude, to me, you're not going anywhere if you don't get your confidence up. You know, to me, like being really insecure and, and, and you know, like you're never going to outperform your own self image period. You get, you're going to have to raise your self worth to raise your net worth. Mm. You got to rise to the level of your belief. And what I talk about in that book as well is that so often we don't feel worthy. So we don't receive or believe that we deserve this. And as a result of that, you never achieve what you could achieve. We cut off the flow of the energy yeah, that's my that is coming your way. I want to fix that. Now, some people might say, well, wait a minute, Brad, you're extremely successful. And I always say, compared to who? Mm. That's good. Because it's, no, I'm not compared to these people. You're comparing me to these people. Well, number one, I don't compare myself to those people. I compare myself to these people. Is that a problem? Yeah, you shouldn't compare yourself to anyone. E. You should basically compare yourself to, to yourself. the self that you want to create. David Jeremiah said, the definition of success is the fulfillment of God's plan for your life. And so what is the ultimate plan for you? Is my kids plan what I want for them or what they're meant to be and who they're meant to be in this world? My kids are now 25 and 23. Yeah, but don't you, don't you, I mean, do you believe that there's some fate involved, some destiny? Big time. Big time. I do believe, I do believe in destiny. I do believe that. So then why try it all? Because part of the destiny is you working. Part of the destiny, part of the plan. I think there are multiple futures that can be created. To no, think that no, God no. has one future. Yeah, but I'm talking about like when it comes to kids. Like, hey, dad, I want to quit school. Hey, buddy. It's already <laughs> figured out, man. Just do you, brother. All right, I, do I whatever you'd like because it's all going to work out regardless uh, of what you do because that's destiny. No, no, no. Destiny is also, there's a discipline that's a part of destiny. There's uh, a devotion that's see, a part of destiny. we disagree on that. So to you, me, th you think you just have a destiny no matter what you do? The word destiny, destiny, if you look up the definition and, right. and what it means is basically something's going to happen no matter what. Your fate, your destiny, it's it's the same freaking thing. Matter of fact, let's, let's get serious advice. Let me undo my phone. I always love getting definitions. <laughs> you know what? Do, do you know why? Because then, dude, I just go off the simplest definition. Yeah. So let's let's hear. Okay. Hey Siri, define destiny. Destiny means the events that will necessarily happen to a particular person or thing in the future. Things that will necessarily happen, yes, which, right. which means it's going to happen one way or the other. So you want to quit school, son? Quit school. Why? Because it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's going to happen. Whatever's going to happen. That's your destiny. That's your fate, son. Nothing you can do will change it. So then why try? Why not just move on and allow yourself to float wherever you go? Because taking action and living this life and free will is also part of the equation as well. So we are right now arguing about the ultimate argument. Everyone literally throughout history, theologians have debated this between free will and determination. Like, are we, is there basically, has God called certain people and not others? Do we have a free will along the way? That is the ultimate argument between, is there 
But that's why I, Calvinism is basically everything is planned out and that is the future and there's really no say in it. And then that, the free will says we can actually create our future. I believe in that one. Don't you? I do believe in that. I do believe in free will, but I also know that there are certain things that let me ask you, did you love your wife or did you choose to love her? Like when you met her and you started to spend time with her, why her and not someone else? Didn't you just have Depends a love for Depends on which her? one you're talking about. The one you're with right now. Well, I'm with six right now. Okay. We're polygamists. <laughs> I don't believe that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't that be fun though? No, it was happy there for a second, and, but not. No, that. actually, it wouldn't. It would not be fun, dude. I don't care what people think. If they're telling the truth, like I can barely handle one. I was going to say, my wife is enough for me. I don't need yeah. any more. And not, and exactly. So it's like to me, uh, making a joke. By the way, and some people won't like that joke. They won't like that joke. And, and see, I don't care. Why? Well, because honestly, I feel like I validate myself. I don't need you to validate me. Why? Because I validate myself. Why? Well, because I know that I can. I know that I'm worth validating. In other words, who are you? Well, I'm me. You see what I'm saying? But why are you worth but, anything? Why but, you, I need, but why are you worth anything? Well, well, again, that's what I don't know. It's like, to me, deep down, I think when you're saying, if you, if you don't think you're worth it, like to me, what have I really done? I haven't really done anything. People say, well, look at this. Eh, that wasn't really, this really isn't much. You know, is it because I, I see way more? Well, you know, I know people with like freaking $70 million jets and it costs two to $3 million just to operate. Ed's got one. Okay. And it costs two to $3 million a year to operate it. Just operate it, not yeah. fly in it. Yeah. Okay, so it's like, I, I think that's kicking ass. I'm not necessarily kicking ass, although somebody else said, oh, you're kicking a lot of ass. Compared to what? Compared to whom? I want to go back to the fact that why are you worth something and why is there gold inside of you? Why do you want to do something great? Well, I, I think, why, does, why does anyone want to do something great? Why do we deep down? Cause, everyone cause, asks, cause you want to we, be great? I'll tell you says, why. Yes. Deep down, I'll bet if a psychiatrist opened up my brain, it would be to, to, to finally get the approval of my father or some, you know, deep, you know, thing. Greatness, greatness, though, is an ideal. It's not necessarily you would strive for it to try to prove something. It's, there's a greatness ideal that you are striving for at some higher level. Not to be better than anyone else, but there are people that want to achieve excellence. But do you think there are people better than others? In terms of performance in certain, in certain roles and responsibilities and jobs and yeah. skills, but not one human being is not better than another human being. But we all have a measurable worth. We all have a priceless essence within us that is worth far more than any gold, far more than any jet. So how do we discover it, dude? It's about knowing where your worth comes from. I'll and give you an example. We've got to get spiritual to go there, though, to understand, because people say, well, every religion believes that there's a God that loves you and says you're worthy. But actually, that's not true, because for most gods in the spiritual realm, it's about earning God's love, just like you have to earn your parents' love and other people's loves. But the knowledge that you have is really and I'm not trying to say you should be this or not, but it's actually a, a Christian belief that says that there is worth within you. And no matter what you've done and the wrongs you've committed and the sins in your life, that there is still something within you that is worth, that is priceless. And you are priceless and you are, and you are very valuable. And you know, you know, that that's how I always get my perspective to change. When you said, or I think the question was, how do you stay that way? And you said, you don't really stay that way. And I always think, you know, I do, I do stay that way. And the reason why is because every time I start slipping to where I start to think any kind of negative, like I, I call it, you know, down here. Yeah. It's a frequency. State of mind. Yeah. My boy, Wes Watson said, you know, it's, he said it the way I like it the best, which is you, your frequency is what you frequently see. Mm. And that makes sense to me. Like whatever you frequently see becomes your frequency. So is your frequency like the words you were, High state of mind, you know, yeah, like courage and confidence yeah. and, and joy and happiness and love. And like, it's up here on the scale. Then there's negative down here on the scale, depression, anxiety, jealousy, yes. rage. Uh, you got better words for it, but like they're down here. No, but you nailed it. So there, there are the two wolves. We've heard the two wolves story. 
you know, that the ancient Cherokee story, the two yeah. L's, positive and negative, there are two main frequencies. Hey, you want to spend an hour a week with me helping you become a business badass? Well, check out my group in the link below. Our brain is an antenna and we are either tuning into a positive frequency or a negative frequency. And it's why everything in the universe and everything in this world boils down to positive and negative. What is Harry Potter about? Good versus? I don't know. Evil. Go Gollum, that little creature? Evil. I don't watch Black it. Panther, good versus? Black evil. Panther? Yep. Superman, good versus? Evil. Star Wars, good versus? Evil. The Bible. Good versus? Evil. It's why those epic movies resonate with our soul, because the ultimate frequencies is you, positive and negative, good and evil, you think we love all, and fear. You think we all have evil in us? I believe that evil exists. It's a force. You think I have evil in me? No, but evil could use you. And, and you e have evil and in evil you? Could, evil could use me if I let it. Five Ds that will try to sabotage you. Doubt, distortion, which are negative thoughts. Negative thoughts are lies that will tell you things about yourself and your future that just aren't true. I ask people all this time, I'll ask you right now, do your negative thoughts come from you? Yeah. If you believe that, who would ever choose to have a negative thought? Idiots. This blows people's mind. Who would ever cho choose to have a negative thought? Idiots. Pro athletes ever or with? Or na the naive. No, the first thought that comes in, the first thought is not from you. The first thought comes in and it comes in so fast you think it's from you, so you believe it. Then you reinforce it. Then you start speaking out loud. Then you start feeling guilt and shame and discouragement for having those thoughts in the first place. Because you're not aligned. You're not aligned. So what happens is you have the power of the second thought. I had a six-year-old, suicidal. We want to help people. It's with six? 16. Oh. Suicidal. I met with him. He was struggling. He was in the ER two nights before. This is when I knew I needed to write this book. So I see you have a lot of thoughts in your head. He goes, oh, so many. I said, do they bombard you all the time? Oh, yeah. Do they accuse you? Yes, yeah, so much so I just want to give up. Once he understood his negative thoughts were not coming from him, neuroscientists has, have never found a thought inside of a brain. Thoughts exist in consciousness, the internet cloud of consciousness. When you're dreaming, having a nightmare, are you choosing those thoughts? No, they're just coming in. The brain is the hardware. It's where the activation happens of the thought. And it's an antenna, a frequency. So you're tuning into those. The negative thoughts are coming in and they will sabotage you if you let them. So I helped them understand that, and I helped them understand, don't believe the lies that they tell. Start speaking truth to the lies, words of encouragement, words of life, you are valuable. There's a plan for your life. The negative thoughts that are accusing you, making you say your future is hopeless, not true. They're not from you, because he thought something was wrong with him, thought something was broken, something needed to be fixed. Now he's got revved up thought, because he's like trying to fix something. And everyone else thinks he's crazy and something's wrong with him. So now he's got a lot of thoughts. Once he understood this, everything changed. Within a day, his parents go, what did you do? He's like, great now. I texted him just the other day. How you doing? Doing great, Mr. Gordon. High state of mind still. This kid understood the truth and too many people are believing the lies of the negative thoughts that are separating them and dividing them. That third D is discouragement. So the doubt and distortion leads to discouragement and we don't give up because it's hard. We give up because we get discouraged. Fourth D, distraction. Distractions of the enemy of greatness. It keeps you from what matters most and what you're truly meant to do or what you want to do. Fifth D, the root for the Greek word of anxious means to separate and divide. So what do negative thoughts do? They separate you, divide you, and weaken you. This is the ultimate lesson of the one truth. And they make you feel powerless. And so what happens is you start going through life, questioning yourself, not believing you're worth anything. And you start to have more and more of a low state of mind, more depression, more anxiety, more fear, more worry, and you're losing the battle of your mind. But once you teach people how to win the battle, and this is why I'm doing this work, this is why I'm passionate about this, everything changes and now you start to uplift your state of mind with the right frequency. Now you start tuning into the higher frequency and that's why positive frequency is so important. Not Pollyanna positive, not fake positivity stuff, like real grit, real mental toughness, real optimism, real belief. And you said earlier, you'll never rise to the level of your belief, right? I mean, you'll, 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 you'll never go past that level. So you gotta basically have the right set of beliefs to get to the level you wanna go to. How do you get new beliefs? You change your thoughts. You start to believe the thoughts and you start to believe the reality you want to create in what you see. My, let me give you an example, my wife. My wife's outside here as we're talking. My wife, about seven months ago, was like, I'm getting old. I'm getting sore all the time. My body's breaking down. 
I'll never be like I was when I was younger. One negative thought after another. I'm like, what is going on here? So I go to a speaking engagement. I was gone for two days and she'll know I was glad to be gone for those two days. And I come back and she's like a different person. She's all energetic, bouncing around the house, feeling light and free. I go, what's going on here? Did you get a boyfriend or something? She's like, no, no. I met with that health coach. I did the health coaching. I did that testing where they test your blood work, mm -hmm. your DNA, your genes and everything like that. She said, I got the testing and they said, you know, this is something really rare. We don't see this often. They told her, you have the genes of an Olympic athlete. So now she's walking around the house going, I am an Olympic athlete. I am an Olympic. You want to play tennis tomorrow? I will crush you because I'm an Olympic athlete. So now she's literally saying those words, I'm an Olympic athlete. Everything changed. She starts working out. She starts feeling better. The pain goes away. I kid you not. She's now like in great shape, getting fitter and fitter, feeling better and better, younger and younger than ever. What changed? Her thinking. Her thinking. She was elevating her thinking. What elevates her thinking? Gratitude. When you appreciate, you elevate. 100% there. Yeah. And when you're practicing gratitude, abundance flow will flow into your life when gratitude flows out of your heart. So now she's so elevating. That, that, to me, that's the key. Because people always ask me my secret. John, that's my secret right there. Abundance I, will flow into your life when gratitude flows out of your well, heart. Well, I didn't know that. But what I did know is, is when I wake up in the morning and I realize the fact that I just woke up yeah. is worth more than anything I'm going after. It means that wait. I, I've already arrived the second I wake up. The second I wake up is like, this is worth more than anything I could achieve during the day. Because if you don't believe me, ask yourself what you would give up not to wake up. Wow, and the good. answer is going to be nothing. Yep. So, so, you, so you achieve the most magnificent thing on earth in the morning when you open your eyes and realize you get another day. So that means you've already won. So now you start the day as a fucking winner. Yep. That's all you got to do. That's what I do. And that's what I believe is my secret. Because, dude, I dropped out of school when you were going to school. I was like the one that never should have gone anywhere. Parents, they didn't give a shit. Like, you know, again, I know they loved me, but they didn't tell me they loved me. I wasn't a beaver cleaver kid that got my car bought for me and good tutelage and, you know, guidance. None of that. My dad was the kind of dad that basically said, you know, Children should be seen and not heard. So I shouldn't have made it at all. But I think when someone says, what was your secret, if there is one? Gratitude. But also, I'm grateful. But who taught you that? I don't know. Right, and you, you asked me that question. You just had that mindset. You had that understanding. You had that awareness. Is that God-given? Yes, I believe. Well, then thank God. I believe it is. And I believe there's a, a level of consciousness. And I believe other people can tap into that consciousness. Everybody. Us talking. Someone can hear it and start to understand it and believe it. Someone's doing it right now. Right. And it's becoming a download that they will start downloading right now. See, a lot of people have on their favorite stations, the negative station. They are tuned into the negative frequency. We've got to get people to program the positive stations in their favorites. You ever see people that like love drama? Yes, of course. All, like I call them energy something. They're waiting to say, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> There. Whenever I hear that out of someone's <laughs> mouth, dude, I, I immediately freaking get the chills and look to leave the room. What does gratitude do? It connects you to something greater rather than feeling separate. You see, people feel separate. They're not grateful because they don't feel like they're part of something bigger. And they don't feel like there's anything that they could achieve in this world or the world is for them. You wake up thinking, okay, I'm thankful. I'm grateful. But that requires you to be grateful for something. Grateful for something, knowing that there's nothing I'm grateful for other than having the day. Right. But knowing that also like, but there's even a day to be had that there's meaning in today. And when someone doesn't have the meaning, even in today, they start to feel more and more like they're in despair. So I'm sure because I get a lot of DMS and emails and st of, of people going, Brad, you know, you motivated me. You did. You inspired me. This and that and the other thing, but you do it for a living professionally. Yeah. So, so, when people come to you, I'm sure some have come depressed. Yeah. What do you do? Put them in a coaching program or do you like when you go talk to the teams to make them winners? Like, what do you say to fire them up? I say a lot of different things to fire them up. A lot of it is the state of mind stuff we're talking about. Like I'll be going to several training camps coming up, Texas. I'll be speaking to them. I'll be speaking to Clemson again and a number of other teams. And when I do that, I'll be sharing this year. I'm going to share tune 
T-U-N-E, which is how do we tune to a higher frequency? How do we tune into how do we? the more positive? I'm going to share with you right now. T is trust and truth. So when the doubt comes in, we trust. And then we speak truth to the lies. And the truth is, this is truth. There is greatness within you. Yeah, but 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 that I agree that that's truth. But how do people know that that's true? No, I'm going to tell you. That's their problem truth. is they don't know that that's true. They do it in their in their soul. They know the soul knows before we do because truth is written in your heart and also on paper. It's already written in you. But do you realize some of these people that are thinking about suicide and contemplating suicide? They do not believe what right. you're saying. Because, they, they they believe and they're they've hearing been, the opposite because they've been believing the lies this whole time. The lies that they're not enough. The lies that their future is hopeless. The lies that they're not going to get through whatever they're going through right now. They're believing the lies. We talked about the five Ds. And that second D is distortion. And that distortion are lies that will tell you things about yourself and your future that just aren't true. So how do you true. get rid of the five Ds? Well, you got to no, you got to overcome the five Ds, but you know the five Ds. See, once, I, I would say you got to grow a pair of Ds. Once you... Un- <laughs> once you, you know what Ds are? Yeah. <laughs> once you, yeah, you got to grow well, a pair of Ds. To grow the pair of Ds, you got to know what the five Ds are. So if you know your enemy's game plan and you know their weapons of choice, you can now create a different plan, a better plan to overcome it. 100%. That's what tune is. Okay, I know the Ds. So instead of doubt, what am I going to do? I'm going to trust. Then I'm going to understand. I'm going to understand. I'm gonna, and I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust. Then I'm going to negotiate. What's the end? Well, no, I got it. First, I got to trust. Then I got to you, unite with the love. Oh, I thought it was understand. No, unite with the love. You How do you do that? Because love casts out fear. How do you unite with it? The minute you focus on love, you're uniting with it. So you unite with love. I would say also unite with God, but I know not everyone believes that, but God is love. So you unite with God, unite with love. Why? There's a force always trying to divide you and separate you. This is the battle of the universe right here. Force always trying to divide you and separate you. And That's a, the evil, by the way. Evil. And there's a power of, of love and God always tr- not, is trying to unite you back to oneness and himself. And everything can be explained in terms of oneness and separateness. And so once you understand that, I'm going to unite with love. So what am I going to do? I'm going to trust. And then I'm going to move forward in my life with love, loving what I get to do, loving today, loving selling. Now, what if you don't though? You're not going to love everything about it. But love is a choice in the moment in terms of I can choose to love what I'm doing. I can choose to love people. Isn't everything a choice? Yes. And I can choose to love people. I may not like what I'm selling right now. I would say try to find a product you love to sell. Because if you love it, you're going to sell it with more purpose and passion. But love is a choice. I'm going to love people today. So everyone I get to interact with, I'm going to love those people. So unite with love. We talked about this earlier. It gives you connection. That leads to clarity, gives you confidence, and then leads to courage. That's why love is so important. Confidence, clarity, connection, courage, essential. Then there's N, neutralize the negativity. This is what Catherine does now. When those negative thoughts come in, this is what everyone could do. On the left side of a piece of paper, write down your negative thoughts that you have often. I have mine. I'm sure you have some of yours, right? They come in. You know what mine are? I wish I was taller. Five, eight and a half. My brother's six, two. You wish you were a baller? I am a baller, but I wish I was taller. I am definitely a baller. Anyone who's competing against me knows I'm a baller. But I wish I was taller, right? Because I go against and work with all these professional athletes and everyone's taller. If you had a phone and a girl, would you call her? (laughs) I love that. You know the song I'm referencing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so funny. They, they can play it in the video if they don't if they don't get that. Let's do it. So so I wish I was taller, but your negative thoughts on the rights of a piece of paper, write down the words of encouragement that you will say to combat those lies and those negative thoughts. We, so so we gotta do exercise? this on a daily basis. Oh, and say it again. Write down what? Write down the words of encouragement, the words of life, the words of positivity that will help you overcome the negative thoughts that you have. So if I'm walking around and I'm like, dude. I'm like, you know, I ain't that f- cool. I'm now supposed to think up the words that I would combat that with. Yeah. Like, yes, you are. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. You know You're what? You're cool. Yeah, you are cool. You know what? There's a plan for your life. Yeah. Work hard. And guess what? You can create this. You know what? Your dreams are possible. All that kind of stuff. Like, What about pumping music into your ears and doing some push-ups? I'm a big fan of music. I'm a big fan of that energy that fuels you. Also, push-ups, exercise. You start lifting. You start working out, you start walking, you start running, you start training. To me, you improve, that means improving. You're going to improve, but you're also going to elevate your state of mind. 
because you're producing all these great endorphins and emotions and chemicals going coursing through your body, elevating your antenna. I guarantee in the future, we're going to understand how working out and exercise elevates our state of mind, which is essential. Or just even raises your antenna. It raises your antenna down. Because if your antenna's down here, it's getting all the frequencies down here. It raises it. You raise your antenna up here, you get the frequencies up here. Big How time. do you raise your antenna? Big time. You raise it by E is the elevating your thinking. So N is neutralizing negativity. We've got trust and truth, unite with love, neutralize the negativity on a daily basis. Because you got to do it. It's going to come in. You got to win the battle every single day. When those negative thoughts come in, I say no. And I speak words of life. All right, I got to just tell you this real quick. Dr. I know, G. It's, it's easy to say. I say no. No. But some people, okay. they can't say no. Okay. They, they believe that shit. Dr. James Gills. Right. But it's a freaking journey. Not every day is it going to feel right. But you do it day in and day out over time. And you start tuning your antenna to the positive frequency every single day. Over I like the, the analogy. This is what I did. I took a gratitude walk every day when I was depressed and anxious and fearful and worried about my future, losing my job during the dot-com crash. How am I gonna support my family? How am I gonna provide for them? My wife and I were fighting all the time. I'm blaming her. What for, were you fighting about? I'm blaming her for why our life was so bad, why I'm not living up what to my her, dream. What was, what was she doing? Nothing, it was my fault for it, but I know, I'm blaming but what'd her. you say she was doing? No, I just said. How are you blaming I her? I was just looking for someone to blame. But how are you blaming Because I had a wife and kids that I couldn't go after my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dude, so that's a fucked up mindset to have. It, well, it there's is. millions of people with that same mindset right now. Why do you think I was losing the battle of my mind? I wanted to curse there for a second. Why do you think I was losing the battle of my mind in that moment? See, isn't aren't you? Don't, why didn't you? Why didn't I lose the battle? No, why didn't you curse just now when you felt like it? No, oh. because you're mindful. See, that's where I lack. <laughs> Like mindfully, I should be like, you know, it's probably going to get shared more if I don't say. No, yeah. I actually think people like cursing. People, it's fun, you know. Dude, well, I'll tell you, here's what I said the other day, because like my team bleeps out a lot of things I'm saying. And I'm like, come on, dude. Like, well, they'll, they'll, they'll do this and they'll do that. And I said, listen, go look at, for example, Gary Vee's YouTube. It's got, yeah. let's say, 13 million followers. Yeah. He's got a clean channel. It's, you, it's Gary Vee with no cussing. Oh, really? Yeah. And there's 13,000 subscribers. 13 million to 13,000 people are like, you know, what does that tell you? That tells you that it don't really matter. People are, 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 are I think grown ups, And if they like your message, it doesn't matter if you drop an F bomb now and again. Although I have had people say, Brad, I wish you wouldn't. So I could share it to more people. Cause I'm not going to send your trash mouth <laughs> to my freaking, you know, Christian children or, you know, my Christian family. So, so, so some lately I've been thinking, yeah. I'm going to elevate my content a little bit. Stop cussing so much because I think the message is good and it needs to get out there. And I think by dropping an F-bomb right in the middle, it, it, you know, holds it back. You're smart enough to realize don't do it. The question is, so is, is it, Ed let by the way, is it, the question is, is it necessary? No, but if, it is fun. If it's fun. And, and necessary. when you're, and when you're just in the flow, who gives a fuck? Hey, <laughs> fuck, fuck. <laughs> That's what I think. What because if you don't that? like me because I said fuck, well then you're weird in right. my book. And that's the thing, like I'm not a big I'm not a big fan of cursing, but at the same time, I never judge anyone who does curse. And I'll always rather someone be real. If you're just doing it to get a rise out of people, I don't like that either. But if it's naturally part of who you are and like the essence, low class. No, 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 no. <laughs> if, if, it's your, if it's your not, if it's your essence, but that's my insecurity. And you play cursing in that moment. I think it's low class. But you, I, oh, but you do. I, but I do it, which which tells me what. I must think I'm low class. There's there's a negative thought coming in there. There's a negative thought That's coming in there. That's creating some separation. There's there's creating some sort of, oh, it's the frick. Because when I was little, dude, I used to lie like you wouldn't believe. And it was because I was embarrassed that we were the poorest family in the neighborhood. Because you'll never see this nowadays. Right. But we lived in a little shitty house next to these big, beautiful houses on top of this hill. And then my dad eventually built the house up into a beautiful house with the rest wow. of the beautiful houses. And then of course they lost it. We had to move out of that house. Wow. But at the end of the day, before the big house was there, the little house was there and the little house, we were the lees. Ooh, the lees like, ooh, scummy lees. That's more, but that's what I used to think that everybody thought about right. us. And so I'd lie 
to try and fit in and try to, I, I, had, I had people thinking my dad owned Disneyland, you know, then they'd quickly figure out that I didn't, that we didn't, and we weren't rich. And I was telling them we're rich. We're really rich. Don't, don't let this scumball shit fool you. Well, turns out, uh, they knew better okay. and alienated me for, let's say three, three years till I moved out of that town. Do you think that's what scarred me? Yeah. There's a connection of oneness that you were seeking, but you felt separate and you felt less than. And what happens is the gap between the oneness and the separateness, we try to fill it. And you're trying to fill it with some sense of validation and you were lying to. But maybe to that's what's fueled me because now I just fuck you. How about okay. that? So you're right. So there's a part of that that we actually will fuel ourselves with it. And that's why we strive. To prove That's why we to try everybody. to perform because we want to fill that hole in our soul and we'll do it with wealth and money and power and often cheap substitutes along the way to have that feeling. But the ultimate key is, and again, it could use, it could be used as a, as a bigger purpose for your life. And sometimes again, I do believe God allows us to have the hole in our soul and go through experiences like that to cause us to be kind of people who will actually strive. I, I had it. My father, my biological father left when I was a year old. So I got that within me that there was something within me that strove initially to want to but be successful. But you don't remember when you were one. So how no, can but, that affect but you? I still had, it's weird. I still had this sense of it like abandonment and sense of just not being loved. And I think a lot of people struggle with not being loved, not being recognized. So how did I get my recognition? But through, see, but, but through see, sports. Did through, you? Through, oh yeah, through sports, through success, through being a good student. And then it was, all right, be successful, make money. And that's when I lost my job to go back to, to the thing when I lost my job and I was blaming Catherine. My identity was too fragile to own it myself. So now I'm blaming her and everyone else and the world because I can't accept the fact that something is wrong with me or something needs to change within me. And so for the first time, I lost everything. And now this young guy who was striving and creating all the success now had nothing. It was about to lose it all. But that's where you find everything you need when you lose everything you thought you not, you needed. I wish I would have said that better without you, uh, you know. But, um, but that's the key. You thought you needed it, but no, what I really needed was to become whole. And that began my journey of healing. And those gratitude walks every day started to tune me into the positive. Appreciation, thank you. Not for, for, for big things at first, but, but small things. And every day that appreciation started to change my frequency and what I'm tuning into. And all of a sudden, now I'm getting healthier. I'm getting happier, right? I'm getting better. It didn't happen overnight. Tuning the mind every single day. But we all have the hole in our soul and you will fill it with one thing or another. And it will drive you. But eventually, Brad, it will become your demise if you don't heal it. Because mm. the wound gets infected if we don't heal it. It's called constraint theory. You'll never rise above the level of your constraint. Mm. And so if you don't heal it, it, then the constraint actually starts to take you down like this. And eventually it will be your downfall. Tiger Woods had a constraint. Eventually it's sabotage. You can see this with any great leader. If they don't heal the crap they have, they don't heal that hole in their soul, it eventually will get infected and cause their destruction and their demise. But so often things happen in life that allow us and give us chances to heal. Now, dude, do you have like coaching and stuff? I know that you have a positive university. Yep. I can't believe it's not on light speed, by the way. Yeah, it's, well, maybe we need to talk. It's positive university. It's a it's a podcast. Oh, yeah, it's a it's it's a, a, it's no. a course. Yeah, it's a podcast. I don't even have courses, real courses yet. I'm actually going to do a mindset course. If you ever do a course, we can you. help you. Uh, that's what we do here. That's oh. how I got successful. I love it. But but we can definitely help you with courses. It says you have one. My team says you know courses positive university. I'm like, why? Positive you is our is our. Podcast. podcast and then i have some video programs based on the books energy bus training camp the carpenter so i have these video programs i'm going to do one for for this one on again on how much mindset. how much how much money do those video programs make you not a fortune because we don't really push them a lot what if i could show you how to make millions per month with those video courses oh, that'd be great but you got to stop calling them video courses yeah, you, show, you, call them, you call them courses right i just I, I, technically again i would say it's you mm. you know Allow me to teach you X, 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 X. Well, you're brilliant at that. Well, that's because you, people are liking you. They don't want a, your video. They want you. Mm. And even though you are in your video, you could say it's me. Let me that teach is you this. Let me teach you that. I love that. Don't talk about videos because videos yeah. worth 29 bucks. Let me you're teach you worth this. a lot. Yes. How much should I charge for a mindset course? It depends on what it does for somebody. This this course is going to be what I'm teaching. It's, it's, but, it's but life changing. Watch, but watch, it's tangible when I can tell you, like, for example, 
if I charged you, and this is real, if I charged you $1 million and in 15 seconds, I could teach you how to make $10 million, would you pay it? Of course. Right. But if, but if I said, I'll charge you $1 million and in 15 seconds, I can teach you to make $10,000, right. you're not going to pay it. Right. There's an ROI attached to it. Yeah. So when people say, well, what should I charge? Well, dude, I mean, it depends on what it does. Mm. I mean, that sounds like it changes lives. How much is changing your life worth? Right. Now the question is, is who are you trying to target and who are you trying to help? Because I, for some reason, like to help the underdog. I like to help the person that's struggling, even though I'm supposed to be targeting the ones with money. Why? Because well, the ones with money will have money to give me. Right. But I always think the ones with money don't need me. The ones with no money need me. And then how do you sell people with no money? Right. So I'm stuck in this quandary of like, I want to help everybody, but you can't sometimes you can only help those who are swimming towards you because if they're swimming away from you, it makes it 10 times harder. Oh, that's good. I try to help everyone that I can. I do it through the books. Then I do a lot of keynotes. So I'm doing a lot of speaking. I'm just starting to do some, some bigger events. Patrick Lencioni and I, who wrote five dysfunctions of a team and other books, we're doing our own event in November 2nd. And it's us, just us two, $7,500 for the day. So only 75 top leaders from around the country. And we're doing this leadership event. We're going to share a lot of leadership stuff, but where, where, where you, why are you guys stuck on 75? VIP is 15,000 to have dinner the night before. And then 7,500 for, uh, for the day. And we're almost actually sold out. But you only day. want 75 people there? Yeah. For your then, few, then, then I'm just saying it should be more. For a future one, I'm going to charge more. For, but just for this first, it was my first one. You want to test it, see if it oh, works. Yeah, and, and the fact that we're almost sold out and the event's in November. <laughs> see? Is a good sign. And when this drops, dude, it'll sell out completely. Right, is a good Where sign. do people go to get those tickets if they want them? Uh, they go to um, a day with John and Pat. But just sign up for my newsletter. You, I'll be promoting it at johngordon.com or any social media. I'll be sharing this on social media coming up as well. Well, dude, I'm going to have to have you back one of these days. There's a lot to talk about. We you got, got 28 a lot more bucks. to talk about. Well, I mean, we barely scratched the surface. I know you got to go because you couldn't. I was trying to push this for later in the day. What time is it? 119. No, no, no. That's how long it's been. It's 128. 128 right now? And it's been an hour and yeah, I've already missed my, one of the I've longest. I've already missed my luncheon, but it's okay. I enjoyed this. You, you had a luncheon? Yeah, this is worth it. You were going to push, this you were going to push a luncheon. Who's it with? It. It's a bunch of NBA people, but it's fine. Oh. This is more important. Well, I know that you just had a birthday wish by Damian Lillard. My it man, was, my man, Damian. It was my 52nd birthday, but we were celebrating my 50th. Well, why uh, are all these, you know, top athletes wishing you happy birthday? Do you work with them on what? Yeah. So when, when confidence Dave, mindset, when, no, when, when Dave Roberts got the job with the Dodgers, as the manager of the Dodgers, he reached out. He read my book, You Win in the Locker Room First, which is all about building a great culture and great leadership. So he reached out. And so I basically went and spoke to his team, worked with him and his leadership staff, his coaches. And then I share culture, how to build a great culture. How do you build a great team? My expertise is leadership, right? How to be a great leader. And then mindset, how to be a great leader with a great mindset that overcomes adversity, challenges, obstacles. This book, The One Truth, is the next level. Like this book, I really believe is going to shift the paradigm in psychology because no one's been talking about the brain as an antenna. Our, med our medical model has failed dramatically. We're giving people more and more medication and the problems are getting worse and worse because we're not dealing with the real issues. That's a whole other talk. We can come back and talk about that. But that's my expertise. So now I work with these coaches. Dabo Sweeney calls. Hey, we used your book training camp last year. Will you come speak to my team this year? Yes. So that's how it happens. They read your books. They reach out. Sean McVay with the Rams. I worked with Sean McVay. Ever since Sean McVay became the head coach of the Rams, I've been working with him. Eric Spolcher of the Miami Heat. I've worked with Eric for a number of years now, speaking to his team, his players, his coaches. So, so that's what happens. And then companies. I work with a ton of corporate leaders who want me to speak to their leaders to help them become better leaders. Mm. It's my purpose. It's well, my calling. Well, I know you got a lot more to talk about. We'll have you back, folks. Go get the book, The One Truth. Go follow him on social media at John Gordon 11 or go to johngordon.com. By the way, John, J-O-N, so it's probably Jonathan. Right. It is. It was a Jonathan. My brother is David. Johngordon.com, folks. Best-selling author, speaker, consultant, all-around good guy. Appreciate you coming in. Hey, thanks, man. And as always, until next time, keep it real. I, see, I normally will start out by saying you have to be the content, right? You have to be the content. And then you have to, you know, basically hire or do creative work, headlines, 
subtitles. You got to know what outlets to put it on. You got to know how often to do it. And then eventually you get to paid. But I used to talk about all of that and then find out later that nobody really did anything and I couldn't figure out why they didn't do anything. <laughs> 